Hi everyone, we're, we're gonna get started here in a couple minutes. Just gonna give time for folks to filter in. All right, Charlie, what do you say? You want to get going here? Sure. Just to be sensitive on time. Great. Hey, everyone. I appreciate everybody joining the Modern Robotic Operations Center, uh, something we call the MROC at Ashling. Uh, really excited to, to be talking about this topic. Uh, this is something that is near and dear to our hearts and uh, a lot of our clients' hearts. So. Uh, Hopefully this will be a part education and part uh, collaboration. So that's, that is the hope of today. Charlie, can you go to the next slide? So uh, we're gonna go through the agenda. Uh, my name is Marshall Seed. I'm one of the co-founders of Ashland Partners. Uh, Charlie asked me to just say a, a couple of things at the beginning, uh, just in regards to the grander, broader view of what's happening right now within intelligent automation and frankly, just uh, you know, kind of more of a future of work discussion. Uh, and so there's obviously a lot of change happening. Uh, I myself come from the ERP process reengineering background, and uh, I have never seen this much emerging technology thrown on both business and IT's desks ever. Uh, and so it can be certainly overwhelming. Uh, so not just on the capability front, but also on how we're going to maintain and support in kind of a run state. Uh, it's certainly something that a lot of organizations are uh, working their way through. Uh, we think 2021, uh, due to scale of not just volume, but also capability, is going to you know, basically uh, emphasize even more the need to focus on the run and support side of the house, uh, which really kind of brings us to the, the conversation here today. Charlie, can you go to the next slide? Uh, and, and just for folks that don't know uh, Ashling Partner, uh, Ashling Partners in general. So we really kind of simplify that, that world. Uh, we're really all about uh, kind of bringing to the world what the world needs more of, which is frankly awareness and education. Uh, and then that leads to action, uh, which leads to insights and improvement and self-awareness. So, you know, that's really how we bucketize uh, our services. And that's really how we see the world within intelligent automation. Today, we're really gonna be focused on the sustain and iterate and improve piece, which is really manifests itself in our world via our modern robotic operations center, which Charlie is going to, to really kind of lead that discussion here today. Uh, so for an agenda, Charlie, if you could go to the next slide. Oh, we, uh, the, yeah, we are gonna do the intros and then I have an agenda slide after this. Sure. Great, so Marshall, are you good transitioning to the intros? Absolutely. All right. Thanks, Marshall. And uh, thanks, everyone, for joining today. Um, really excited to spend the next uh, hour together. So thought we would start with a quick round of introductions of the participants in today's session. Uh, I'll start and then um, we'll work kind of left to right on the slide. So I'm Charlie Jacoby. Uh, I've been working in the automation space for the last five plus years. Uh, I was a member of the leadership team for a scaled intelligent automation program at a large healthcare company, and I now lead the Modern Robotic Process Operations Center at Ashling Partners. So with that, I'll turn it over to Michelle. Hi, everyone. My name is Michelle Yarofsky. I'm the lead for insights here at UiPath and also for 
kind of all things analytics on the product side. I've been at the company for three years now, and I started off on the professional services team. So I was very hands-on with customers building out automations, and I got really interested in analytics and started focusing on that. And then I got asked to lead the charge. So it's been really fun. Awesome. Thanks, Michelle. Brandy? Can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, Brandy Corbell, I'm a VP of Transformation at Cushman and Wakefield. Um, I really led standing up our capabilities internally and have been working closely with um, Ashland on the MROC side. Thanks, Brandy. Thomas? I'm Thomas Mandel. I'm one of the senior analysts on the Cushman and Wakefield transformation team. So I've got to see the, the evolution and get to work with and interact with the MROC team on almost a, a daily basis with a lot of the processes and projects that I've helped to push through production and continue to support through that long-term support phase. Great, thanks, Thomas. And Dan. Hi, uh, Dan Hart um, from NSK Americas. I'm the director of finance. Uh, we are a uh, global, uh, generally tier one, in some cases tier two automotive supplier. Uh, based out of Ann Arbor, Michigan. Uh, I've been with NSK uh, for about 20 years and um, most recently uh, brought uh, RPA to NSK uh, about a year and a half ago uh, going live. Great. Thanks for having me. Great. Okay, so moving on to the agenda. Um, so we have four agenda topics for today. I'm gonna lead off with a discussion around the modern rock and really talking about the modern rock is a critical strategic component as organizations look to scale automation. And then I'm gonna turn it over to Michelle, who's gonna uh, talk about unlocking uh, data in production automations and uh, how we can ut utilize UiPath Insights to do that. And she's gonna do a demo of that capability as well. And then uh, we're gonna have an industry panel uh, and uh, Brandy, Thomas and Dan are gonna join us for that. And they're gonna give us some insight on real world experiences with production automations. And then time permitting, we'll open it up for Q and A. Okay, so uh, I'm just gonna use the next several slides really to expand uh, on uh, what is the Modern Robotic Operations Center, give it some context, provide some definition. And then I wanna do a double click into uh, the release management capability, which is one of the core items within the ROC and has been important to uh, a lot of clients that we talk to. And then I wanna finish with um, why there really is a need for robotic operations uh, as uh, organizations are really starting to scale in the automation, in the automation space and how robotic operations operations has really been coming into focus of late. So with that, uh, I think a good place to start, um, you know, I, I think as Marshall mentioned how uh, the space is evolving, we're really seeing companies expand their automation footprint. And with that um, is the need for a more modern approach to managing production automations. This is a different space and there are different requirements than like standard application support uh, that we've all seen in our past ERP lives, et cetera. And so there are some really uh, unique things that need to happen to have a successful uh, automation program that has, um, you know, production automations that are supported on a day in and day out basis for what are often very mission critical transactions that those automations are performing. And having that in place is really gonna allow organizations to be able to get to scale and to really get the full value um, that, uh, that companies have been expecting as they've been mining for use cases and uh, designing the opportunities for automation. So with that, I think it is helpful to take a look back and get some context and some historical context on where automation has come and how it's evolved. So if we look back um, just in kind of that 22 or the 2016 timeframe, uh, companies were really focused on task automation and it was a lot of desktop automation with manual triggers. There were macros that have been around for years and, and many, many organizations were executing macros for core processes. Um, many of those automations on the desktop and with macros were very siloed. They were like per user or team. And so you weren't even really at the department level. You were within individual users and individual teams uh, within those departments. And it was really hard. There was business value, but it was hard 
hard to get your arms around like you know what is the full measurement of that business value and what are you know there's there've got to be additional incremental opportunities so then as we got into the 2017 2018 um, time frame we started to see the rapid evolution of rpa and it really started out with an education on the art of the possible and to get people thinking about okay i was doing these task automations prior what's really different about rpa and what can it bring to my organization and obviously you know at the beginning of these things there's a lot of skepticism so there was a need to really get to um, what is the opportunity for delivery of business value is this really real and so companies were getting educated on the art of the possible then doing some POCs and pilots to demonstrate the capability and see if there was true business value and then getting some initial production deployments but the way these things were you know the way these projects and programs were really operating is you know, the core team was engaging in everything. So they were, you know, looking for the user stories, doing the education, implementing the POCs and pilot, implementing some of those early automations and then managing those in production. And then as we got into 2019 and 20, um, there was, there really was an, you know, an acknowledgement, I think that there really is value being realized and not only value being realized on individual processes, but now we're really looking at multiple process opportunities. And at the same time, there was a recognition of the convergence of adjacent technologies to RPA, like machine learning and AI and voice analytics. And people are starting to recognize the power that RPA could bring in orchestrating some of these additional technology capabilities together into a cohesive unit to drive value through automation. And, um, and that focus really allowed for a broadening of the use cases. So then the backlog of use cases started growing because there were more applicable use cases and organizations were really starting to increase production employee uh, production deployments and and more and more companies were really looking to scale because uh, of the demonstrated value. So then we get to early 2020, Gartner at the, actually at the end of 2019, Gartner terms the coin uh, uh, hyper automation. And it's a concept really around like targeting whole business functions and whole functional areas and looking across those for all the automation opportunities and trying to wring as much um, or, or trying to bring as much automation capability to uh, those end-to-end -end business uh, processes. And then the robotic platforms are really evolving as well. So now the evolution of these robotics platforms serve as really the hub for automation and orchestrating multiple capabilities and being able to use like an AI fabric or um, machine learning uh, Python, Python uh, algorithms to, um, to really harness all of those capabilities and and drive even more value so with this um, many more organizations were getting to material scale uh, in their production deployments and with that um, they were also getting to larger backlogs, um, often coming in through uh, agile processes and work that was done to generate additional use cases, and so there was this convergence uh, of more backlogs, more things into production, and a need to start thinking about specialization around support. And once things move into production, it's you, you can't have you know one team who's focused on upfront work also managing all of the things in production. And there needed to be uh, more sophisticated ways to uh, monitor and manage um, those automations to make sure that we that uh, organizations were reali realizing full business value from those. So with that, um, the concept uh, of the modern rock is something we've been talking about at Ashling for a while now. And um, there are really three levels to it. And so I'm gonna spend uh, a few minutes here talking about those uh, and bringing some additional detail to how we think about the modern rock. So level one is really core, level two is differentiated and level three is strategic and strategic insights. And so as we get into uh, each of these, so at the core, obviously you've got to have some kind of service desk capability, the ability to receive issues, items, inquiries, and that's really through kind of what we think of as a, a standard ticketing process. But what's a little bit different in the automation space is because these 
these uh, automation capabilities are so transaction oriented and often so instrumental in you know getting work backlog done and, and business operations, et cetera. The SLAs and the response times and the things that are needed by the, the business are a little bit different. So being able to have a automation defined uh, service desk uh, is really critical and core uh, to the MROC. In addition to that, there's some nuances with infrastructure because um, virtual machines, virtual desktop instances are prevalent and at the forefront of uh, automation uh, deployments and capabilities. And so the management of that infrastructure and ensuring that that infrastructure is up able, you know, and, and ready and, and able to process at the volume necessary for these automations is uh, another core component. And then the other piece, and I'm going to do a, a deeper dive on this in a later slide, but application release management. So how do you um, take automations, you know, package them up and move them into production? And uh, how do you do that when you have federated delivery teams and organizations, including more citizen developers than you do maybe in, you know, other areas, citizen developers are relatively new concept in the automation space. So uh, really being able to have a consistent process to manage break fix enhancements, uh, regression testing, et cetera. So uh, I'll, I'll provide some additional uh, detail on that in a subsequent slide. So then at level two, um, we start talking about differentiated capabilities. And this is where monitoring and performance reporting come in and kind of the dashboards around automation. But if we think about um, what, uh, you know, one of the key things with, um, with these automations is, is making sure that they're performing not only successfully te technologically, like the bot is starting, picking up information and finishing from a technology perspective, but also that the volume of business transactions that are expected are flowing through that and that it's operating at those business transaction levels that are necessary for the business to be successful. So the monitoring is not just about technically is everything working, although that's a major component to make sure technically everything's working and things complete as expected and they complete per the schedule, but also are we seeing the transactional volume that we're expecting? And if we aren't, who, who do we need to work with to make sure that, you know, that that, that can be uh, remediated so that, uh, so that the business can get the value that they're expecting out of the automations. In addition to that, uh, operations management, so business continuity, bot capacity, and optimization. So essentially, these bots are digital employees. And um, the, you know, one of the differences with digital employees is they can work 24-7 or as long as an organization's systems are up and available. So we can feed those bots as much work as they can get done in that period. And so they can run multiple process scripts throughout that 24-7 period, but keeping a close eye on, OK, where are we really at with capacity? Can we add on? To, to, to those bots or do we need to hire more digital employees, essentially bring in uh, more bots is a, is a core component of uh, what The Rock does on behalf of the organization. Then as we move to level three, we get into strategic insights. And you know, I think the, um, the Rock is gonna serve a critical, uh, as a critical bridge to the digital office. Uh, and as a part of that, you know, as we talk about these bots being digital employees, um, you know, they need to be, these digital employees are, you know, they need to be retrained, like when a process changes, just like you need to retrain an employee. Well, eventually as these business operation uh, organizations evolve, they're going to have a staff likely of employees as we think of them today, human employees, as well as digital employees, and they will be stitched together and operate kind of holistically. But in the near term, um, there are some unique things that we're doing in the in the rock that are enabling those digital employees to be successful. And then having that tight communication with the business teams who are expecting the output of those digital employees and have them as part of their staffing plan, et cetera. So that I think uh, is evolving and I, I think the rock will be a, a key bridge to uh, the digital office. And then uh, obviously we have a wealth of data uh, available to us as we're uh, looking at these production automations and what they're processing. And so doing data mining against that and looking for continuous improvement opportunities within the automation, within the automations that are running, but then also importantly, uh, identifying additional use cases uh, that can be then um, that can be then uh, communicated, you know, to COEs or other parts of the business to contemplate those for um, additional opportunities to realize value uh, through the automation program. 
So as I promised, um, I want to just do a, a quick double click on the application release management piece. So having a, a um, well-defined and smooth operating application release management process and capability really leads to efficient, uh, qual uh, efficient and high quality production code migrations. And as a result of that, you get stability in production because if you're not able to promote high quality code that's been through a process, you're gonna have instability in production. And so having a process like this in place is critical. And then also um, we hear from a lot of our clients uh, uh, comments about se uh, segregation of duty requirements. So this is really how do we make sure that developers of code are not promoters of code? Uh, and that's where the rock can play a really integral role in having that separation, um, which uh, you know, will satisfy audit and other requirements, et cetera. Uh, and and is, is a demonstrated best practice. So um, what, I, what I have here and that I'm gonna walk through um, is an example of how we handle application release management in an Azure DevOps environment. And so um, the way the process starts is that an automation um, developer would push code into uh, a Git repository. It would flow uh, through these steps. And then we've built some custom capabilities to do extractions of descriptions and variables, et cetera. And then we've also configured a workflow analyzer capability, um, which is actually embedded in the UI path uh, robotics capability. And we've configured that to look for the key things that demonstrate quality within scripts. And so if you know, the script then gets through that, then we uh, have met a certain quality threshold that gives us confidence as we're looking to move that into production. And then we finish out the process as we move here with uh, a push of key components of the automation into SQL tables. And then those SQL tables are linked to dashboards and they're aggregated by build IDs. So we can have really good tracking uh, of um, the code, uh, the promotion process, and this really drives quality uh, in, into our automation program. Okay, um, so with the ever expanding and evolving automation capabilities, um, the tremendous appetite that organizations have right now for scale and the need to really have modern techniques to be able to get there, um, hopefully you can see from the uh, last few slides and the last few minutes of this discussion that um, we are really passionate about the convergence of these things and uh, how this wraps into the concept of the modern robotic operations center. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Michelle and uh, she's gonna talk about um, how UiPath Insights can help to unlock data on production automation. So Michelle, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. All and right. then do you, I'll, um, I'll advance so the slides for you and then you wanna take it to do the demo. Is that all right? That sounds great. Okay. Yep, that's perfect, thank you. Okay, um, if we could go to the next one, please. So everyone implements RPA because they're looking for something, some goal, whether it's you want to save a certain amount of money or a certain amount of time, or you want to increase maybe your compliance from 98% to 100%, or you've, you've basically been promised that there's some outcome that you're going to get from RPA. The question is, how do you measure if after you've implemented RPA, you've actually met that outcome? So with that goal in mind, we've created a tool that hopefully going to help you measure everything you're looking for. So just a few logos, um, customers okay. that are using kind of insights, <laughs> no problem. Um, we can just get past this one. Okay. So data is kind of the key to understanding your robots because here at UiPath, we like to say robots don't speak. They can't tell you if they're sick. They can't tell you if something has gone wrong. So the language that you can speak with them is data. And that's why you need to have data-driven development. And that's why you need to be able to track your results with some reporting tool. Um, and specifically with Insights, we've kind of tried to combine the best of both worlds as far as reporting goes. And we'll dive a little bit into what that means in a future slide. If you go to the next one, please. Perfect. So when you start implementing RPA, usually what I've seen is a trend where Customers are thinking about, okay, well, I just need to know if my robots are successful or not. I want to know if how many processes I've run, um, you know, very kind of operational metrics. The problem is, is that 
you focus on those operational metrics and then it comes time to present this information to your leadership and they say, well, why should we invest in RPA again? And you can say things like, well, you know, my, my runs were 95% successful, but that doesn't actually tell them anything about what's going on with your deployment. Is it meeting the objectives they asked for? Is it worth the investment? So part of the things that you need to be aware of is that you need to, yes, measure your deployment, but you also need to be tracking business KPIs that relate to why you implemented RPA in the first place. Whether that's things like, um, you know, when you're doing invoice processing, tracking invoice number, vendor name, you know, things that help you report on specific metrics like how many vendors submitted invoices this month and what was the most common error amongst vendors and how much money is this costing our business right now because we can't process it. So things like that go under this kind of step two of optimize my processes, track those specific metrics and via those metrics, understand how to further optimize your automation. So if you're seeing um, you know, that a certain vendor always has this error and you weren't accounting for that error previously and you think other vendors will run into it, you add it to your automations as a condition to consider. So it's, it's always this kind of loop where you need to understand the outcome to further optimize development. And then that helps you scale because if you're understanding things like the benefits of RPA, you're gonna be able to make a much bigger case for why you should keep using it. Next slide, please. Okay, so what have we done with insights? Um, the, the goal is for you to be able to measure both of those kinds of aspects. The operational things like what's my success percentage, but also things like how much time and money did I save? We could go to the next one, please. Great. So. Some things that we really focus on on our out-of-the-box dashboards, um, robot utilization, success rate of your automation, how long they took, um, business-specific outcomes, not in the out-of-the-box dashboards necessarily, but we'll talk about this one. Uh, we have a special dashboard aimed towards time and money saved. Uh, then we have time and money saved, as you can see, and that falls under the ROI dashboard, um, which is a totally custom template that's made for you to kind of take as almost a base and fix depending on what you consider time and money saved, because I have yet to see a customer consider it the same. Um, an example, someone wanted to count the cost of air conditioning on the like human cost side of the equation for, for money saved. So it really varies. And then of course, tracking things like errors. Uh, next, please. So just some highlights about Insights. Um, if you're already using Orchestrator from UiPath, Insights is currently integrated inside of Orchestrator. So you set it up and you just launch it from the same kind of place. So the UI you're used to, the experience you're used to, it's, uh, it's all consistent. We also have alerts so that you can get notified of a various uh, kind of range of things, whether it's something like a threshold alert, meaning, you know, I hit 10 errors uh, in the last 15 minutes or anomaly detection, which goes a step above. And this is for you to see if things in your data are anomalous without you having to specify what that means. So that's backed by a machine learning algorithm that actually checks your data to see what is and isn't standard for you. Then we have dynamic dashboards. So I think this is probably one of the, the things that I like the most about the product is the fact that it's, it's so easy to just drag and drop widgets from one dashboard to another and also to customize. Um, so we provide a ton of formulas that you can use to take our dashboards and customize them for whatever fits your needs. So I built the dashboards thinking that they cover about 98% of operational needs. And so far, the feedback I've gotten is that uh, they do a pretty good job of that. We also allow you to forecast. So things like um, maybe the number of transactional errors you're seeing, you can forecast to see what that trend is going to look like in time. And that's also based on historical trends. So Insights is all about historical data. If you've used monitoring before inside of Orchestrator, it's real time, but it lasts for 24 hours. So after 24 hours, you lose that data, whereas in Insights, you can keep that data historically. So analyze up to, I don't know, two, five years. Um, really depends on your data amount, but we can scale quite large. So I've, I've yet to hear of anyone hitting a bottleneck on time. And lastly, we have shareable reports. So uh, share a PDF, uh, an image with someone that needs to see your report without actually having to go inside of Insights and view it. Uh, next slide, please. All right, time for the demo then.
Uh, if I could share my screen. Sure, I'll stop sharing here. Thank you. All right. Perfect. Uh, so for those of you that aren't familiar with kind of UiPath or Orchestrator, I'll just quickly explain to you what this is. So what you're seeing right now is the Insights tab inside of Orchestrator. Orchestrator is basically our command and control center for robots. So this is where you kind of schedule jobs and, and deploy them and also keep track of things like uh, global variables you want to reference across your automations. So it, it's really all about management and control. Then when we come to Insights, this is your homepage. These are out of the box dashboards. So everyone that uses Insights gets these dashboards unless you don't want them to, which is something that we rolled out with our latest release. So you can control who gets these dashboards and who doesn't based on what role they've been assigned inside of Insights. So there's definitely a bunch of personas that would be using an analytics tool like this. Some of them are your standard management that has no idea how this works and doesn't want to and just kind of wants to pop in and maybe interact with the dashboard and then log out. Or you have more of the RPA developer side of things or a business analyst that's pretty tech savvy and they want to come in and actually build dashboards. And we've even been seeing process owners um, like citizen developers that come in and, and want to build a dashboard based off of something they've automated. So they can use any of these templates as a baseline. So if we come into, let's say, processes. Here you see we have a filter pane. I'll just minimize this so you have a little bit more real estate. In the processes dashboard, we call out some pretty standard metrics like the number of processes you've run, your success rate, and again, it highlights your completed jobs, your top 10 processes by runs and status, top 10 processes with faulted jobs. Um, and just a tip, this kind of scatter plot is really good for finding data with anomalies because as you can see, it's really easy to tell that there's something here that has disproportionately more errors. Here we have our weekly runs and details about errors. So something that you've probably noticed if you try to build your own reporting uh, kind of display in, in a tool like Power BI or Tableau if you're using UiPath is that you have to pick and choose whether you want data from Orchestrator or you want data from the robot log because the, the two data types don't play too nicely together. And so um, we have out of the box dashboards for Power BI and Tableau, but those focus on what comes out of Orchestrator and they don't have robot logs. So error messages, those come from robot logs and that's really the best way for you to get informed as to what has gone wrong in your automation. If we wanna interact with the dashboard, there's a bunch of ways for us to do this. So they come with pre-canned filters the today filter is turned off. You can turn it on if you want and then modify that time. Um, we also have a folder filter, which is uh, just a UiPath kind of uh, security segregation layer. You can also interact with the dashboard by clicking. So if we come back to this top 10 processes with faulted jobs, if you want to drill into why this dispatch queue item has you know, disproportionately more errors, you can just click it and it'll add it as a default filter on the filters pane. And if it keeps scrolling up, you'll see it's highlighted here. You now see the success percentage for it. You see the runtime stats for this process specifically. And if we scroll down to error details, you also see the errors specifically about this process and the numbers. So this is a really good way for you to keep an eye as far as operationally, um, how your automations themselves are doing. Then if we go back to our out of the box set, which you can see here, or you can go back to the home page, we can drill into our robot dashboard. Something that a lot of people are concerned about is, are you using your robots effectively? Are you really making the best out of them? When we think about unattended robots, robots that can work 24 seven, don't need a human, can work behind lock screens. Um, you can use them 24 hours a day, but if you're only using them for three, as we are here, you have a lot of room to scale. So robot utilization is kind of your key to understanding if you're really using what you have effectively. And it, it's easy to know if you need to scale up or scale down. If you're using three hours a day of a robot and you, know, you only have three processes in production, this is an opportunity for you to automate a lot more inside of your business. Here we have our total utilization across the robot types. If we scroll down, you can see a little bit more about um, average utilization per day per robot, which robot types you have, uh, and then your top 10 robots with errors. So this is a really easy way for you to drill into a specific robot that is having these errors, which probably links back to a specific cause. So maybe there's something wrong with that machine. 
maybe the one process that it's running is built poorly. Uh, you know, you can use this kind of information to find out what's going wrong in production. Here you can also see your top 10 busiest robots, so robots that are working the most, and also which processes they're running. Mm -hmm. um, we also have, this is for today, so we don't have uh, any data for today. Um, this is actually going to be a Gantt chart, and you can see exactly which minutes a robot was working or not working. Um, and I get this request a lot because people want to see how much free time that robot has and during which time they can schedule more work. We'll skip over queues because that's a very UiPath specific uh, kind of data type. So we'll move right on to our ROI dashboard. This is kind of the most of the templates. And the reason I say that is because time and money saved is so subjective, depending on who you ask. The dashboard comes with this process baselines widget. And here we have um, the process name, the manual time in minutes it takes a human to complete that process, as well as the hourly cost. And these are all manual inputs. But a lot of customers want to add more dimensions to this. Instead of maybe hourly cost, they want yearly cost. Or instead of time in minutes, they want hours. Or um, maybe they want things like business-specific metrics, like um, points that they maybe assign. So this is a place to do it. All of the widgets on this dashboard depend on formulas. So the time saved, money saved, all of these are using formulas that I'll just quickly walk you through. If we come to time saved, um, just a warning, this is a case statement so that it doesn't show zero when it's negative, <laughs> so don't get overwhelmed. Um, if we just come to the else, you'll see here this is all a formula and it's referencing that process baselines manual time. And because you can add and remove columns, you can reference whatever you want. So if we come and look at how this is done, you see these are just manually inputted. So maybe I can put in a few more here. And then if I hit apply, it'll reload everything. This is also a really great place for you to use forecasting. So you can forecast, let's say your time saved over the next, I don't know, week, month, and it's really up to you. Lastly, let's quickly talk about how you can use insights for business specific outcomes. Um, the way we extract custom data that you've added to your workflows is we create a new process table. Uh, let's look at log email. This is a great example. So it will be called process dash, whatever that process name is. And then any custom fields you've added are going to be pulled out in this raw message section. Uh, now, the only custom field we've added is email. And if we wanted to click to see what that email was, it'll show us here. So this is actually not the email. This is the... Um, a little bit more information, this is about the mailbox type. But using things like this, you can also get, um, like I was mentioning, invoice number, vendor name, and create those use case specific dashboards that though they are referencing data from RPA are actually showing why you implemented it in the first place with real data that makes sense to you. And with that, I think we've pretty much covered it. Um, so thank you and I will turn it back to you, Charlie. Thanks, Michelle. Appreciate it. Okay, um, so that brings us to real world experiences in our industry panel. So I'm really excited about this portion. Um, because it really gets, it gives us a chance to hear uh, from Brandy, Thomas, and Dan about um, what they're seeing in the real world. So uh, with that, uh, I thought I'd kick us off um, with um, uh, Brandy and Dan, uh, maybe just starting us out with, um, if you could give the audience uh, a quick overview of your intelligent automation journeys and uh, some perspective you have there. And uh, Brandy, I think we'll start with you. Um, Charlie, I think you might be in showing presentation mode as well with your speaker notes. <laughs> oh, whoops. You're Sorry. fine. Um, so at Cushman, our journey really started last April. Uh, so April 2019, it's crazy to think about now with a proof of concept with um, a larger, more end-to-end -end process, uh, not just like really task automation, but really 
a larger end-to-end -end automation process that impacts about you know 300 people. So coming out of that proof of concept, that that group had signed up for a larger business case that we started working on. What would this look like to put into production? Um, our executive team was really excited, so we did a top-down assessment um, with our next-level leaders on their you know business units and where opportunities could kind of fit inside of each of our business units, um, service lines, as well as back office functions. Coming out of that, that was late 2019, we had about another $15 million uh, business case. And, you know, at that point, we really had to start thinking about what does our internal capability look like? And how does a strategic partner fit into this? And that's when we started really engaging with Ashling um, on really, you know, what does run and support look like because we knew people were excited. So how do we we take off with this and not lose momentum coming out of the back half of last year. So this year has really been focused on standing up the team and standing up the partnerships throughout our organization. Um, you know, we've kind of expanded outside of RPA and we have, you know, machine learning model um, in one of our end to end process automations and production. We do have NLP in our stack. And then we've started really using process mining. So at the highest level, that's kind of our journey and where we're at today. And, you know, really starting to look at shifting into our methodology of delivery. So moving from more of a uh, waterfall methodology into an agile methodology as we go into 2021 and really accelerate after we've stood this up. Great, thanks, Brandy. Uh, Dan, over to you. Thanks, Charlie. Um, yeah, so for uh, for an SK, we really started thinking about RPA uh, back in about 2017, and immediately our thought went to applicability in uh, AP and voice processing, uh, which I think is a common place a lot of companies start. Uh, this is also concurrent with the deployment of Oracle EBS uh, for all of our North American locations. So uh, that was going to introduce all sorts of new controls and tables process compared to our legacy system, and actually resulted in us adding a uh, substantial headcount to a the AP function uh, to uh, kind of resolve that. Uh, we knew locally that um, our Japanese parent already had a, a relationship with UiPath, so it seemed like a no-brainer to, to kind of start there. Um, we just started discussions with uh, with them in uh, about mid-2018. Uh, we're put in touch with Ashling, uh, contracted with them to, to stand up a pilot automation um, to automate our PO-based, our purchase <laughs> order-based accounts payable invoices. Uh, that kicked off in about June of 2019 and went live in October. Um, concurrently with that, we uh, stood up an RPA uh, Center of Excellence to kind of oversee the, not only that project, but uh, also sponsor sessions uh, to kind of blue sky uh, other automation candidates uh, across uh, a handful of areas of NSK, but uh, initially uh, really focused just in finance. Um, but at present, we're, we're now uh, kicking off our, uh, what we're calling kind of wave two automations. Uh, we have three of them, uh, one each in finance, uh, HR, and internal audit, um, and we're in introducing some additional enhance enhancements to uh, that AP automation that, that we already are, have in place. Uh, we currently have, I'd say, 30 to 40 uh, really solid candidates in our pipeline uh, that are undergoing evaluation um, considerations and uh, and really, you know, now starting to think about expanding uh, those pipelines into the sales divisions, uh, logistics, manufacturing, and, and all sorts of areas outside of just the back office. Great, thanks for that, Dan. So um, now maybe shifting the discussion a little bit to uh, the topic at hand today uh, around managing production automation. So maybe I'll start with you, Brandy, on uh, how did you really start thinking about at Cushman managing your production automations and what are the most important benefits that you've seen so far uh, since you've uh, implemented uh, the Modern Robotic Operations Center? Yeah, so I, you know, coming from the consulting side, I've been in the industry for a little bit. So I would say we were uh, first a little bit more proactive when it came to understanding that support would be needed. It looked a little different as we first started and got ramped up, but it was a part of like our initial thoughts. We did want a different support team than we, we did um, a build team, if you will. Um, so, so we started thinking about that up front, but then as you know, we thought about scale in 2020, um, we started working with with you all, Charlie, really on how do we, you know, make this a little bit more capable of handling scale and thinking about it differently. So 
for us, it was more about keeping that separation of, you know, net new automation and then really like keeping the lights on for anything that's in production, only because we knew the program that we had in place and that the benefits wouldn't be realized if we just kept the lights on for what got put into production in the first six months of this year. Um, and also, I think, you know, it, it, it was more for a scale and velocity perspective and also thinking about you know, our program is very end-to-end -end process automation oriented, not task automation oriented. So if you think about something failing, it's a lot more critical for the things that we have production in production today and the things that we'll continue to put into production. So really having that support allows us to create the scale as we think about a group of 300 people, like kind of relying on these automations in order to perform their jobs. So for us, that's really, you know, the why or the how we started thinking about it as far as you know important benefits we've seen um so far as you know with the rock in place there you know you all are catching things like prior to us having to send an email and say hey something didn't work um and there's really constant communication back and forth from our coe with the rock on making sure those things turn on before the business uh feels it so I would say that's one of the, the big pieces. And I think the second thing is really, we have a really strong group of senior analysts that are working with the business every day and they, they can't really keep the lights on and then help the business think about transforming their business, right? So like this has really allowed our senior analysts to be able to spend their time appropriately on continuing to add value to their business partners. Um, I would say the second thing. And then really the third thing that we've seen from this that's really important is just the thought leadership that we're getting, um, you know, as we think about operations and, you know, you know, looking at the bridge that you had created, I still think there's a lot that we can do, you know, I think we have the mm -hmm. foundation, but really excited to see, you know, really like the differentiated piece and the strategic piece start coming into play. We're seeing it a little bit, but I think, you know, for us, we're starting to see that maturity start and really excited to see it kind of come through in the next year. Great, awesome insights. Thanks, Brandy. Um, Dan, in a similar vein, uh, maybe you could talk a little bit about um, how you were thinking about it at NSK as you were doing your early automations. You know, how are you thinking about the production management of those? And then maybe you could um, give two or three things that um, those folks listening today should consider uh, as they're contemplating, um, you know, their their automations in a production environment. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so uh, it, it sounds like what, what I'm about to tell you is, is kind of what our vision is. Uh, we're, we're a little behind Cushman and, and moving to the MRAC, um, but it's good to hear uh, from Brandy that uh, that transition has been a success. So uh, we're looking forward to that. But, um, you know, as, as we sit here presently, kind of ahead of uh, uh, putting the MRAC in place for NSK, you know, our business, business analysts in, uh, in our IT function are, are actively managing the bots, uh, reporting problems and opportunities through uh, support tickets. Uh, has been mentioned, um, and in the absence of the, the MRAC, it's, it's really critical that we have uh, internal resources uh, kind of dedicated, assigned to monitor and, and assure bot functionality, uh, system uptime, that sort of thing. So uh, issues can quickly re uh, kind of be reported into uh, our partners uh, to help resolve them. Um, uh, you know, we we just don't have a great level of knowledge internally that's uh, been developed yet. So. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're heavily, heavily reliant on, on uh, Ashling as, as a partner in that space uh, on our single automation right now. But, um, you know, I imagine even with the MROC in place, uh, having kind of moderately experienced internal people uh, familiar with the operations um, to be assigned, you know, as key points of contact is, is really critical um, to kind of, you know, proper functioning of, of the design of this type of support model. Uh, you know, as uh, it sounds like from Brandy's experience, you know, our view in, in moving to the MROC is really the advantages is for our analysts to be you know, less hands-on and, and shift a lot of that monitoring, uh, as well as you know, tuning and, and improvement opportunities uh, to Ashling. Um, so we're, we're hoping, you know, as I shared, we have a growing number of automations picking up our, our wave two here. Uh, we really need to start paying more attention to our bot performance, uh, which you know, our understanding is the MROC uh, will, will do that on a much more active basis than we're able to do today. Um, Further, you know, our, our internal support analysts and, and others involved uh, on kind of our RPA trajectory uh, really ought to be spending their time uh, educating themselves um, and you know, learning to write scripts and, and more simple automations and uh, really growing our internal capabilities. And, and right now they're spending a lot of time uh, kind of, you know, monitoring and maintaining uh, our, our existing automation. So 
uh, as you know, as our RPA footprint increases, we, we really want to have a greater capability to further develop automations. Um, I would say finally, you know, as it kind of it probably goes without saying, but um, you know, everything along the RPA, RPA journey really requires uh, kind of executive sponsorship and support. Um, you know, the, those at the top, and, and we're fortunate at NSK that this is the case, but uh, really need to be committed to supporting, um, you know, the, the endeavor, uh, you know, through investment in technology, uh, training, uh, and people uh, for it really to be a successful proposition. Great. Thanks, Dan. Um, all right, uh, Thomas. So uh, in your role as a uh, senior analyst as part of the transformation team in, in Brandy's organization, I know you interface uh, daily, probably multiple times a day with the MROC team. Um, so maybe you could give uh, some examples of how that really works and how it enables you to address some of the challenges you face with uh, the production automations that you have in place for your uh, business partners across Cushman and Wakefield. Yeah, thank you, Charlie. I think the the two biggest points of impact that I notice on a almost you know daily or at least weekly basis interacting with the MROC team is is first as you know Brandy had mentioned the more proactive issue identification resolution. So prior to to having that dedicated support function, I was in that role interfacing with the the business anytime there was an an error that came up with a with a bot or we noticed that a process hadn't executed successfully, where now, instead of me having to respond to that directly or receiving a request from the business, what we're seeing is that the MROC team's identifying those exceptions, responding within a matter of minutes, letting the business know what the exception was, that it's being evaluated, and then usually coming back fairly quickly with a resolution to that issue with the, the bot run, which for me, you know, allows me to, to free up time to focus on supporting current initiatives and, and just to be there to, to get engaged with the team if there are more complex questions that, that they have around the process. And for the business, they're seeing, you know, almost immediate feedback when they see an error message, they're seeing someone respond to and get assigned to that right away. And I think the other area of benefit with interacting with the team is just the the very quick collaboration for more complex issues that we see during the initial phases of an automation being in production. So being able to hop on an impromptu call with the, the MROC support team, evaluate a, a new error that we haven't seen before in the process and quickly come to a, a resolution and propose solution on it and start having the team create and develop and, and test that fix so we can get the automation back up and running. I think that's been a, a really huge piece for us as we think about ex accelerating the time that we can quickly resolve these errors. Great, great perspectives. Thanks, Thomas. So um, Brandy, Thomas, Dan, thanks a lot for the perspectives and uh, sharing your experiences. Um, that was great. I think the audience uh, really appreciated it and uh, also uh, appreciated you underscoring some of the key uh, benefits of having a robotic operations center in place. So uh, thanks again. And uh, with that, Marshall, I think um, we're gonna uh, kick over to Q&A here. Uh, but before we do that, I think we had a couple polling questions. Did you wanna um, share those with the audience? Sure, yeah, I think we've got two polling questions here. So I'll launch that and we'll give everybody 60 seconds. And we'll show kind of the dynamic results here. So first poll question is top priority for your automation program just at, at a high level in general. And the second is uh, about the dedicated team.
All right, I am going to close out the poll. We will share the results. So pretty even split across top priority. Uh, production support is actually one of the lower ones at this point. So probably means that a lot of folks are, are still kind of building up the awareness and demand on the front end of their program. And then for the second piece, uh, a lot of organizations do have a dedicated team in place, uh, whether that's external or internal or a hybrid. Uh, so that's good, that should, should enable some scale. Cool. Well, thanks everybody for uh, for your inputs on the polls. Uh, so we had a couple questions come in here. Uh, so the first one, actually, the first two probably, Charlie, are directed towards you, I would think, uh, and then we can we can certainly open it up to the, the panel as well. The first question is around emerging tech. What type of emerging technology are you guys leveraging in order to make your rock service successful? Uh, and then let me let me add the second one so you can sure. probably answer them in the same tweet. Uh, can you talk a little bit more about the handshake between build and run organizations? Sure. Let me, um, I'll start out with the handshake between the uh, build and run organization. So um, this is a really uh, critical component that transaction or that transition point between build and run. Um, it needs to be very planful and, uh, and I'll explain the process that we use. So we have, um, obviously we're closely connected with the build team and we understand what the pipeline is, which allows us to plan. And what we try to do is based on the go live dates of automations is a couple weeks ahead of time, we're um, consuming the PDDs, SDDs, any documentation, user stories um, that exist uh, for the automation uh, that is gonna be moving into production. And then uh, in the week prior to production, we're doing a code review um, with the development team. And then as that, um, and then we're involved, obviously, as we talked about segregation of duties in the promotion of the code into production. And when that, when that automation goes into production, we have a hyper care period of two weeks, um, give or take, depending on the complexity, but we're pretty consistent on the, on the two weeks, uh, where the developer is still accountable for ensuring that the automation is performing successfully and helping with any changes that need to happen in production. And the rock resource is shadowing. And then at the end of that two week period that flips to a certain extent. And, uh, and the main thing is the rock resource becomes accountable for that production automation. They obviously can still reach out to the developer but the developer is uh, hopefully 100% focused on uh, new development, new automation development. And so that's really how, how we do the handshake um, between uh, the build team and the rock team. And then the emerging tech question is a, a great one. Um, we are very actively um, evaluating different capabilities. Um, we're looking at some uh, AI capabilities to predict um, when uh, bots are likely to fail based on uh, data that we have in the logs. Um, we are um, looking at some capabilities that can do some self-corrections. Um, we're actually um, looking at some support bot capabilities that we can um, basically custom build out that will allow us to do um, even more automated monitoring and uh, management of bots in production. So hopefully that answers the question. I think it does. Uh, let's go to the next Q&A here. I'm sure we could have opened that one up to, to Brandy Thomas and Dan as well. Uh, but the next one I think is, is good for for the client panel here. Uh, how do you assess business criticality of your automations? And I'm, I'm assuming that's related to how does that translate over to severity levels? So Brandy, you're smiling, you get to go first. <laughs> well, you know, it's interesting, like I think for us and, you know, Charlie like and his team get to like feel this a little bit. A lot of the stuff we're doing is, you know, actually client facing deliverables. Um, and it does impact about 300 plus people in each of our programs. So as we think about criticality, I would say almost everything we have in production right now is pretty business critical. Um, so with that, it's really the main driver of why we put into place 24 by seven support. We don't have like weekday support just while like people are online, it's 24 by seven. Just knowing the mass of people that are impacted and the fact that most of the stuff that is getting delivered by a bot will at the end of the day get delivered to a client. Um, we haven't really seen a situation, I don't think, but uh, I could be proven wrong, that 
um, any of our processes are not business critical because as I mentioned, we're not really doing task automation. It's all end to end um, automation. And really it's really important, especially as we start getting human in the loop components that we do fix whatever the bot is doing upstream or downstream. So the whole transaction will work um, to its entirety. I don't know if that answers a question. That's really where we're at right now. I don't Charlie, if you want to chime in on it, but um, that's where we are. No, I, I concur with everything you said there. So I, uh, I do have a question for that came in for Michelle. So Michelle, I'm not sure if you're you're still on here listening. Uh, so it's about a future release integrations. Are there any integrations that Insights will have that aren't there today with other aspects of the in, of the UI path platform? Oh, can't hear you, Michelle. Yeah, sorry, my phone was muted too. Um, that, that's a great question. So one of our key priorities for kind of the next year or two is to really build out those integrations with the rest of the UiPath suite, right? We have everything from discover all the way to measure, but not a super clear way to visualize all of that data in one place. And that's really what we hope to use Insights for. So you should be seeing integrations um, as early as early next year, hopefully, but definitely would like to have the whole suite integrated within the next two or three years. Great. Thanks, Michelle. Okay. Uh, we're not going to get through all these. We'll ask one more and then we'll, uh, we'll close. And I'm going to direct this one to Thomas. So uh, it's a general question, Thomas, but I think you will have good experience to answer this. How are you supporting non-business rule-driven automations in your program? So I am assuming this is referring to ML more than anything else at this point or OCR. Yeah, so I can I can speak to this. So we have a automation that that I help to execute and lead into production that has both a RPA as well as a NLG component to it. So we're scanning in invoice documents, having those go through an OCR platform, and then there's an RPA process that goes on top of that. So it, it kind of goes into that hybrid support approach of we not only have the the UI path side of the process, but we have the the OCR side as well. So that's something that that I've been heavily in, involved in with the project that recently recently went live. So we've thought about it in the in the two components of there's the the RPA piece of it that is the same scope of of what would be handled by the the MROC, and then really the OCR component of it is something that we look at from a a continuous monitoring perspective more so on the, the business end since there's a human in the loop component to make sure as part of our production monitoring and support, we're not seeing items that get stuck in that queue to be processed. We're seeing those actively get pushed through and we're monitoring the, the accuracy of that that feeds into the RPA process. So it adds on that additional layer of we can make sure that the RPA process takes in all of those inputs once it's received and it's executing correctly, but we're also monitoring that the inputs from the OCR platform are in fact accurate. And if we are noticing any inaccuracies, how do we retrain that model effectively so we get those issues corrected at the, the source so we put better data through the automation? Thanks, Thomas. Great insights there. So, Charlie, uh, that's probably a, a good breaking point here to be respectful of time. Do you want to bring us home here? Yeah, um, really appreciate everybody uh, joining today. Thanks for the panel. And uh, thanks, Michelle, for the UiPath Insights Overview. Um, I've got my contact information here, so uh, feel free to reach out. If there are follow-on questions, I'll sync up with Marshall on the ones that were submitted that we didn't get to. And then, um, happy to have any uh, further discussions or connect uh, people to the right folks to have those discussions. So uh, thanks again, appreciate your time and uh, hopefully we'll be in another forum together soon. Thank you. Happy holidays all. Thanks everyone. Thank you.